Section five of About Orchids A Chat. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Yearsley. About Orchids A Chat by Frederick Boyle. Chapter four. Cool Orchids. This is a subject which would interest every cultured reader, I believe, every householder at least, if he could be brought to understand that it lies well within the range of his practical concerns. But the public has still to be persuaded. It seems strange to the expert that delusions should prevail when orchids are so common and so much talked of, but I know by experience that the majority of people, even among those who love their garden, regard them as fantastic and mysterious creations, designed to all seeming for the greater glory of pedants and millionaires. I try to do my little part, as occasion serves, in correcting this popular error and spreading a knowledge of the facts. It is no less than a duty. If every human being should do what he can to promote the general happiness, it would be downright wicked to leave one's fellow men under the influence of hallucinations that debar them from the most charming of quiet pleasures. I suspect also that the misapprehension of the public is largely due to the conduct of experts in the past. It was a rule with growers formerly, avowed among themselves, to keep their little secrets. When Mr. B. S. Williams published the first edition of his excellent book, forty years ago, he fluttered his colleagues sadly. The plain truth is that no class of plant can be cultivated so easily, as none are so certain to repay the trouble, as the cool orchids. Nearly all the genera of this enormous family have species which grow in a temperate climate, if not in the temperate zone. At this moment, in fact, I recall but two exceptions, Vanda and Phalaenopsis. Many more there are, of course. Half a dozen have occurred to me while I wrote the last six words. But in the small space at command I must cling to generalities. We have at least a hundred genera which will flourish anywhere, if the frost be excluded. And as for species, a list of two thousand would not exhaust them, probably. But a reasonable man may content himself with the great classes of Odontoglossum, Oncidium, Cypripedium, and Lycaste. Among the varieties of these, which no one has ventured to calculate, perhaps, he may spend a happy existence. They have every charm, foliage always green, a graceful habit, flowers that rank among the masterworks of nature. The poor man who succeeds with them in his modest bit of glass has no cause to envy Dives his flaunting Cattleyas and Foxbrush Irides. I should like to publish it in capitals, that nine in ten of those suburban householders who read this book may grow the loveliest of orchids, if they can find courage to try. Odontoglossums stand first, of course. I know not where to begin the list of their supreme merits. It will seem perhaps a striking advantage to many that they burst into flower at any time, as they chance to ripen. I think that the very perfection of culture is discounted somewhat in this instance. The gardener who keeps his plants at the ne plus ultra stage brings them all into bloom within the space of a few weeks. Thus, in the great collections, there is such a show during April, May, and June, as the gardens of paradise could not excel, and hardly a spike in the cool house for the rest of the year. At a large establishment this signifies nothing. When the odontoglossums go off, other things come on, with equal regularity. But the amateur, with his limited assortment, misses every bloom. He has no need for anxiety with this genus. It is their instinct to flower in spring, of course, but they are not pedantic about it in the least. Some tiny detail overlooked here and there, absolutely unimportant to health, will retard fluorescence. It might very well happen that the owner of a dozen pots had one blooming every month successively, and that would mean two spikes open, for with care most odontoglossums last above four weeks. Another virtue, shared by others of the cool class in some degree, is their habit of growing in winter. They take no rest. All the year round their young bulbs are swelling, graceful foliage lengthening, roots pushing, until the spike demands a concentration of all their energy. But winter is the most important time. 
I think any man will see the peculiar blessing of this arrangement. It gives interest to the long dull days, when other plant life is at a standstill. It furnishes material for cheering meditations on a Sunday morning. Is that a trifle? And at this season the pursuit is joy unmixed. We feel no anxious questionings as we go about our daily business. Whether the placens uxor forgot to remind Mary when she went out to pull the blinds down, whether Mary followed the instructions if given, whether those confounded patent ventilators have snapped to again, green fly does not harass us. One syringing a day and one watering per week suffice. Truly these are not grave things, but the issue at stake is precious. We enjoy the boon of relief proportionately. Very few of those who grow odontoglossums know much about the trade, or care, seemingly. It is a curious subject, however. The genus is American exclusively. It ranges over the continent from the northern frontier of Mexico to the southern frontier of Peru, excepting, to speak roughly, the empire of Brazil. This limitation is odd. It cannot be due to temperature simply, for upon the one hand we receive Sophronotis, a very cool genus, from Brazil and several of the coolest cattleyas. Upon the other, Odontoglossum roeslii, a very hot species, and O. vexillarium, most decidedly warm, flourish up to the boundary. Why these should not step across, even if their mountain sisters refuse companionship with the Sophronotis, is a puzzle. Elsewhere, however, they abound. Collectors distinctly foresee the time when all the districts they have worked up to this will be exhausted, but South America contains a prodigious number of square miles, and a day's march from the track carries one into terra incognita. Still, the end will come. The English demand has stripped whole provinces, and now all the civilized world is entering into competition. We are sadly assured that odontoglossums carried off will not be replaced for centuries. Most other genera of orchid propagate so freely that wholesale depredations are made good in very few years. For reasons beyond our comprehension as yet, the odontoglossums stand in different case. No one in England has raised a plant from seed, that we may venture to say definitely. Mr. Cookson and Mr. Veitch, perhaps others also, have obtained living germs, but they died incontinently. Frenchmen, aided by the climate, have been rather more successful. Messieurs Bleu and Moreau have both flowered seedling odontoglots. Monsieur Jacob, who takes charge of Monsieur Edmund de Rothschild's orchids at Armainvilliers, has a considerable number of young plants. The reluctance of odontoglots to propagate is regarded as strange. It supplies a constant theme for discussion among orchidologists. But I think that if we look more closely, it appears consistent with other facts known. For among importations of every genus but this, and Cypripedium, a plant bearing its seed capsules is frequently discovered. But I cannot hear of such an incident in the case of Odontoglossums. They have been arriving in scores of thousands, year by year, for half a century almost, and scarcely anyone recollects observing a seed capsule. This shows how rarely they fertilize in their native home. When that event happens, the odontoglossum is yet more prolific than most, and the germs, of course, are not so delicate under their natural conditions. But the moral to be drawn is that a country, once stripped, will not be reclothed. I interpolate here a profound observation of Mr. Roezl. That wonderful man remarked that odontoglossums grow upon branches thirty feet above the ground. It is rare to find them at thirty-five feet rarer at twenty-five feet. At greater and less heights they do not exist. Here, doubtless, we have the secret of their reluctance to fertilize, but I will offer no comments, because the more one reflects, the more puzzling it becomes. Evidently the seed must be carried above and must fall below that limit, under circumstances which to our apprehension seem just as favorable as those at the altitude of thirty feet, but they do not germinate. Upon the other hand, odontoglossums show no such daintiness of growth in our houses. They flourish at any height, if the general conditions be suitable. Mr. Roezl discovered a secret nevertheless. 
and in good time we shall learn further. To the Royal Horticultural Society of England belongs the honour of first importing orchids methodically and scientifically. Messrs. Weir and Fortune, I believe, were their earliest employees. Another was Theodore Hartwig, who discovered Odontoglossum crispum Alexandri in 1842, but he sent home only dried specimens. From these, Lindley described and classed the plant, aided by the sketch of a Spanish or Peruvian artist, Tagala. A very curious mistake Lindley fell into on either point. The scientific error does not concern us, but he represented the colouring of the flower as yellow with a purple centre. So Tagala painted it, and his drawing survives. It is an odd little story. He certainly had Hartwig's bloom before him, and that certainly was white. But then again, yellow Alexandries have been found since that day. To the Horticultural Society we are indebted, not alone for the discovery of this wonder, but also for its introduction. John Weir was travelling for them when he sent living specimens in 1862. It is not surprising that botanists thought it new after what has been said. As such, Mr. Bateman named it after the young Princess of Wales, a choice most appropriate in every way. Then a few wealthy amateurs took up the business of importation, such as the Duke of Devonshire. But the trade came to see presently that there was money in this new fashion, and imported so vigorously that the society found its exertions needless. Messrs. Rollison of Tooting, Messrs. Veitch of Chelsea, and Messrs. Lowe of Clapton distinguished themselves from the outset. Of these three firms, one is extinct, the second has taken up and made its own the fascinating study of hybridization among orchids. The third still perseveres. Twenty years ago nearly all the great nurserymen in London used to send out their travellers, but they have mostly dropped the practice. Correspondents forward a shipment from time to time. The expenses of the collector are heavy, even if he draw no more than his due and the temptation to make up a fancy bill cannot be resisted by some weak mortals. Then grave losses are always probable. In the case of South American importations, certain. It has happened not once, but a hundred times, that the toil of months, the dangers, the sufferings, and the hard money expended go to absolute waste. Twenty or thirty thousand plants or more an honest man collects, brings them down from the mountains or the forests, packs carefully, and ships. The freight alone may reach from three to eight hundred pounds. I have personally known instances when it exceeded five hundred. The cases arrive in England, and not a living thing therein. A steamship company may reduce its charge under such circumstances, but again and again it will happen that the speculator stands out of a thousand pounds clean when his boxes are opened. He may hope to recover it on the next cargo, but that is still a question of luck. No wonder that men whose business is not confined to orchids withdrew from the risks of importation, returning to roses and lilies and daffodowndillies with a new enthusiasm. There is another point also which has varying force with different characters. The loss of life among those men who go out collecting has been greater proportionately than in any class of which I have heard. In former times, at least, they were chosen haphazard among intelligent and trustworthy employees of the firm. Trustworthiness was a grand point, for reasons hinted. The honest youth, not very strong perhaps in an English climate, went bravely forth into the unhealthiest parts of unhealthy lands, where food is very scarce and very, very rough, where he was wet through day after day for weeks at a time, where the fever of varied sort comes as regularly as Sunday, where from month to month he found no one with whom to exchange a word. I could make out a startling list of the martyrs of orchidology, among Mr. Sanders' collectors alone, Falkenberg perished at Panama, Claboch in Mexico, Andres at Rio Hacha, Wallace in Ecuador, Schroeder in Sierra Leone, Arnold on the Orinoco, Digance in Brazil, Brown in Madagascar. Sir Trevor Lawrence mentions a case where the zealous explorer waded for a fortnight up to his middle in mud, searching for a plant he had heard of. I have not identified this instance of devotion, 
but we know of rarities which would demand perseverance and sufferings almost equal to secure them. If employers could find the heart to tempt a fellow creature into such risks, the chances are that it would prove bad business. For to discover a new or valuable orchid is only the first step in a commercial enterprise. It remains to secure the article, to bring it safely into a realm that may be called civilized, to pack it and superintend its transport through the sweltering lowland to a shipping place. If the collector sicken after finding his prize, these cares are neglected, more or less. If he die, all comes to a full stop. Thus it happens that the importing business has been given up by one firm after another. Odontoglossums, as I said, belong to America, to the mountainous parts of the continent in general. Though it would be wildly rash to pronounce which is the loveliest of orchids, no man with eyes would dispute that O. Crispum Alexandri is the queen of this genus. She has her home in the states of Columbia, and those who seek her make Bogota their headquarters. If the collector wants the broad-petalled variety, he goes about ten days to the southward, before commencing operations. If the narrow-petalled, about two days to the north, on mule-back, of course. His first care on arrival in the neighbourhood, which is unexplored ground, if such he can discover, is to hire a wood, that is, a track of mountain clothed more or less with timber. I have tried to procure one of these leases, which must be odd documents, but orchid farming is a close and secret business. The arrangement concluded in legal form, he hires natives, twenty or fifty or a hundred, as circumstances advise, and sends them to cut down trees, building meantime a wooden stage of sufficient length to bear the plunder expected. This is used for cleaning and drying the plants brought in. Afterwards, if he be prudent, he follows his lumbermen, to see that their indolence does not shirk the big trunks, which give extra trouble naturally, though they yield the best and largest return. It is a terribly wasteful process. If we estimate that a good tree has been felled for every three scraps of odontoglossum which are now established in Europe, that will be no exaggeration, and for many years past they have been arriving by hundreds of thousands annually. But there is no alternative. An European cannot explore that green wilderness overhead. If he could, his accumulations would be so slow and costly as to raise the proceeds to an impossible figure. The natives will not climb, and they would tear the plants to bits. Timber has no value in these parts as yet, but the day approaches when government must interfere. The average yield of Odontoglossum crispum per tree is certainly not more than five large and small together. Once upon a time Mr. Kerbach recovered fifty-three at one felling, and the incident has grown into a legend. Two or three is the usual number. Upon the other hand, fifty or sixty of O. Gloriosum, comparatively worthless, are often secured. The cutters receive a fixed price of sixpence for each orchid, without reference to species or quality. When his concession is exhausted, the traveller overhauls the produce carefully, throwing away those damaged pieces which would ferment in the long hot journey home and spoil the others. When all are clean and dry, he fixes them with copper wire on sticks, which are nailed across boxes for transport. Long experience has laid down rules for each detail of this process. The sticks, for example, are one inch in diameter, fitting into boxes two feet three inches wide, two feet deep, neither more nor less. Then the long file of mules sets out for Bogota, perhaps ten days' march, each animal carrying two boxes, a burden ridiculously light, but on such tracks it is dimension which has to be considered. On arrival at Bogota, the cases are unpacked and examined for the last time, restowed and consigned to the muleteers again. In six days they reach Honda on the Magdalena River, where until lately they were embarked on rafts for a journey of fourteen days to Savanilla. At the present time an American company has established a service of flat-bottomed steamers, which cover the distance in seven days, thus reducing the risks of the journey by one half. But they are still terrible. Not a breath of wind stirs the air at that season, for the collector cannot choose his time. The boxes are piled on deck. Even the pitiless sunshine is not so deadly as the stewing heat below. He has a score of blankets to cover them, on which he lays a thatch of palm leaves, and all day long he souses the pile with water. But too well the poor fellow knows that mischief is busy down below. 
another anxiety possesses him too it may very well be that on arrival at savanilla he has to wait days in that sweltering atmosphere for the royal mail steamer and when it comes in his troubles do not cease for the stowage of the precious cargo is vastly important on deck it will almost certainly be injured by salt water in the hold it will ferment amidships it is apt to be baked by the engine fire whilst writing i learn that mr sander has lost two hundred and sixty-seven cases by this latter mishap as is supposed so utterly hopeless is their condition that he will not go to the expense of overhauling them they lie at southampton and to anybody who will take them away all parties concerned will be grateful the expense of making this shipment a reader may judge from the hints given the royal mail company's charge for freight from manzanilla is seven hundred and fifty pounds i could give an incident of the same class yet more startling with reference to phalaenopsis it is proper to add that the most enterprising of assurance companies do not yet see their way to accept any kind of risks in the orchid trade importers must bear all the burden to me it seems surprising that the plants can be sold so cheap all things considered many persons think and hope that prices will fall and that may probably happen with regard to some genera but the shrewdest of those very shrewd men who conduct the business all look for a rise odontoglossum harianum always reminds me in such an odd association of ideas as every one has experienced of a thunderstorm the contrast of its intense brown blotches with the azure throat and the broad snowy lip affect me somehow with admiring oppression very absurd but on est fait comme ça as nana excused herself to call this most striking flower harianum is grotesque the public is not interested in those circumstances which give the name significance for a few and if there be any flower which demands an expressive title it is this in my judgment possibly it was some indian report which had slipped his recollection that led roezl to predict the discovery of a new odontoglot unlike any other in the very district where odontoglossum harianum was found after his death though the story is quoted as an example of that instinct which guides the heaven-born collector the first plants came unannounced in a small box sent by senor pantoja of colombia to messier horseman in eighteen eighty five and they were flowered next year by messier veitch the dullest who sees it can now imagine the excitement when this marvel was displayed coming from an unknown habitat roezl's prediction occurred to many of his acquaintance i have heard but mr sander had a living faith in his old friend's sagacity forthwith he dispatched a collector to the spot which roezl had named but not visited and found the treasure the legends of orchidology will be gathered one day perhaps and if the editor be competent his volume should be almost as interesting to the public as to the cognoscenti i have been speaking hitherto of colombian odontoglossums which are reckoned among the hardiest of their class along with them in the same temperature grow the cool mass de Vailias, which probably are the most difficult of all to transport there was once a grand consignment of mastevalia schlimii which mr roezl dispatched on his own account it contained twenty-seven thousand plants of this species representing at that time a fortune mr roezl was the luckiest and most experienced of collectors and he took special pains with this unique shipment among twenty-seven thousand two bits survived when the cases were opened the agent hurried them off to stevens's auction rooms and sold them forthwith at forty guineas each but i must stick to odontoglossums speculative as is the business of importing the northern species to gather those of peru and ecuador is almost desperate the roads of colombia are good the population civilized conveniences abound if we compare that region with the orchid-bearing territories of the south there is a fortune to be secured by anyone who will bring to market a lot of odontoglossum nevium in fair condition its habitat is perfectly well known i am not aware that it has a delicate constitution but no collector is so rash or so enthusiastic as to try that adventure again now that its perils are understood and no employer is so reckless as to urge him the true variety of o hallii 
stands in much the same case. To obtain it, the explorer must march in the bed of a torrent, and on the face of a precipice alternately, for an uncertain period of time, with a river to cross about every day, and he has to bring back his loaded mules or Indians over the same pathless waste. The Roraima mountain begins to be regarded as quite easy travel for the orchid hunter nowadays. If I mention that the canoe work on this route demands thirty-two portages, thirty-two loadings and unloadings of the cargo, the reader can judge what a difficult road must be. Ascending the Roraima, Mr. Dressel, collecting for Mr. Sander, lost his herbarium in the Essequibo River. Savants alone are able to estimate the awful nature of the crisis when a comrade loses his grip of that treasure. For them it is needless to add that everything else went to the bottom. One is tempted to linger among the odontoglots, though time is pressing. In no class of orchids are natural hybrids so mysterious and frequent. Sometimes one can detect the parentage. In such cases, doubtless, the crossing occurred but a few generations back. As a rule, however, such plants are the result of breeding in and in from age to age, causing all manner of delightful complications. How many can trace the lineage of Mr. Bull's Odontoglossum delectabile, ivory white, fringed with rose, strikingly blotched with red, and showing a golden labellum, or Mr. Sanders' Odontoglossum alberti edwardi, which has a broad soft margin of gold about its stately petals. Another is rosy white, closely splashed with pale purple, and dotted round the edge with spots of the same tint so thickly placed that they resemble a fringe. Such marvels turn up in an importation without the slightest warning. No peculiarity betrays them until the flowers open, when the lucky purchaser discovers that a plant for which he gave perhaps a shilling is worth an indefinite number of guineas. Lycaste also is a genus peculiar to America, such a favourite among those who know its merits, that the species Lycaste skinneri is called the drawing-room flower. Professor Reichenbach observes in his superb volume that many people utterly ignorant of orchids grow this plant in their miscellaneous collection. I speak of it without prejudice, for to my mind the bloom is stiff, heavy, and poor in colour, but there are tremendous exceptions. In the first place, Lycaste skinneri alba, the pure white variety, beggars all description. Its great flower seems to be sculptured in the snowiest of transparent marble. That stolid, pretentious air which offends one, offends me at least, in the coloured examples, becomes virginal dignity in this case. Then, of the normal type, there are more than a hundred variations recognised, some with lips as deep in tone and as smooth in texture as velvet, of all shades from maroon to brightest crimson. It will be understood that I allude to the common forms in depreciating this species. How vast is the difference between them their commercial value shows. Plants of the same size and the same species range from three shillings and sixpence to thirty-five guineas or more indefinitely. Lycastes are found in the woods, of Guatemala especially, and I have heard no such adventures in the gathering of them as attend odontoglossums. Easily obtained, easily transported, and remarkably easy to grow, of course they are cheap. A man must really give his mind to it to kill a Lycaste. This counts for much, no doubt, in the popularity of the genus, but it has plenty of other virtues. Lycaste skinneri opens in the depth of winter, and all the rest, I think, in the dull months. Then they are profuse of bloom, throwing up half a dozen spikes, or in some species a dozen, from a single bulb, and the flowers last a prodigious time. Their extraordinary thickness in every part enables them to withstand bad air and changes of temperature, so that ladies keep them on a drawing-room table night and day for months, without change perceptible. Mr. Williams names an instance where a Lercasti skinneri, bought in full bloom on February the 2nd, was kept in a sitting-room till May the 18th, when the purchaser took it back, still handsome. I have heard cases more surprising. Of species somewhat less common, there is Lycaste aromatica, a little gem which throws up an indefinite number of short spikes, each crowned with a greenish-yellow triangular sort of cup, deliciously scented. I am acquainted 
with no flower that excites such enthusiasm among ladies who fancy Monsieur Liberty's style of toilette. Sad experience tells me that ten commandments, or twenty, will not restrain them from appropriating it. Lacaste Cruenta is almost as tempting. As for Lacaste Lucanthe, an exquisite combination of pale green and snow white, it ranks with Lacaste Skinneri Alba as a thing too beautiful for words. This species has not been long introduced, and at the moment it is dear proportionately. There is yet another virtue of the Lycaste which appeals to the expert. It lends itself readily to hybridization. This most fascinating pursuit attracts few amateurs as yet, and the professionals have little time or inclination for experiments. They naturally prefer to make such crosses as are almost certain to pay. Thus it comes about that the hybridization of Lycastes has been attempted but recently, and none of the seedlings, so far as I can learn, have flowered. They have been obtained, however, in abundance, not only from direct crossing, but also from alliance with Zygopetalum, Anguloa, and Maxillaria. End of section 5section six of about orchids a chat this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter yearsley about orchids a chat by frederick boyle chapter four cool orchids section two the genus cypripedium ladies slipper is perhaps more widely scattered over the globe than any other class of plant i at least am acquainted with none that approaches it from China to Peru, nay, beyond, from Archangel to Torres Straits. But it is wise to avoid these semi-poetic descriptions. In brief, if we accept Africa and the temperate parts of Australia, there is no large tract of country in the world that does not produce cypripediums, and few authorities doubt that a larger acquaintance with those realms will bring them under the rule. We have a species in England, Cypripedium calceolus, by no means insignificant. It can be purchased from the dealers, but it is almost extinct in this country now. America furnishes a variety of species, which ought to be hardy. They will bear a frost below zero, but our winter damp is intolerable. Mr. Godseff tells me that he has seen Cypripedium spectabile growing like any water-weed in the bogs of New Jersey, where it is frozen hard, roots and all, for several months of the year but very few survive the season in this country, even if protected. Those fine specimens, so common at our spring shows, are imported in the dry state. From the United States also we get the charming C. candidum, C. parviflorum, C. pubescens, and many more less important. Canada and Siberia furnish C. gutatum, C. macranthum, and others. I saw in Russia, and brought home, a magnificent species, tall and stately, bearing a great golden flower, which is not known in the trade, but they all rotted gradually. Therefore I do not recommend these fine outdoor varieties, which the inexperienced are apt to think so easy. At the same cost, others may be brought which, coming from the highlands of hot countries, are used to a moderate damp in winter. Foremost of these, perhaps the oldest of cool orchids in cultivation, is Cypripedium insigne, from Nepal. Everyone knows its original type, which has grown so common that I remarked a healthy pot at a window garden exhibition some years ago in Westminster. One may say that this, the early and familiar form, has no value at present, so many fine varieties have been introduced. A reader may form a notion of the difference when I state that a small plant of exceptional merit sold for thirty guineas a short time ago. It was Cypripedium insigne, but glorified. This ranks among the fascination of orchid culture. You may buy a lot of some common kind, imported, at a price representing coppers for each individual, and among them may appear, when they come to bloom, an eccentricity which sells for a hundred pounds or more. The experienced collector has a volume of such legends. There is another side to the question, truly, but it does not personally interest the class which I address. 
to make a choice among numberless stories of this sort we may take the instance of cypripedium spicerianum it turned up among a quantity of cypripedium insigne in the greenhouse of mrs spicer a lady residing at twickenham astonished at the appearance of this swan among her ducks she asked mr veitch to look at it he was delighted to pay seventy guineas down for such a prize cypripediums propagate easily no more examples came into the market and for some years this lovely species was a treasure for dukes and millionaires it was no secret that the precious novelty came from mrs spicer's greenhouse but to call on a strange lady and demand how she became possessed of a certain plant is not a course of action that commends itself to respectable businessmen the circumstances gave no clue messieurs spicer were and are large manufacturers of paper there is no visible connection betwixt paper and indian orchids by discreet inquiries however it was ascertained that one of the lady's sons had a tea plantation in assam no more was needed by the next mail mr forsterman started for that vague destination and in process of time reached mr spicer's bungalow there he asked for a job none could be found for him but tea planters are hospitable and the stranger was invited to stop for a day or two but he could not lead the conversation towards orchids perhaps because his efforts were too clever perhaps because his host took no interest in the subject one day however mr spicer's manager invited him to go shooting and casually remarked we shall pass the spot where i found those orchids they're making such a fuss about at home be sure mr forsterman was alert that morning thus put upon the track he discovered quantities of it bade the tea planter adieu and went to work but in the very moment of triumph a tiger barred the way his coolies bolted and nothing would persuade them to go further mr forsterman was no shikari but he felt himself called upon to uphold the cause of science and the honour of england at this juncture in great agitation he went for that feline and in short its skin still adorns mrs sander's drawing-room thus it happened that on a certain thursday a small pot of c spicerianum was sold as usual for sixty guineas at stevens's on the thursday following all the world could buy fine plants at a guinea cypripedium is the favourite orchid of the day it has every advantage except to my perverse mind brilliancy of colour none show a whole tone even the lovely c niveum is not pure white my views however find no backing at all other points the genus deserves to be a favourite in the first place it is the most interesting of all orchids to science then its endless variations of form its astonishing oddities its wide range of hues its easy culture its readiness to hybridize and to ripen seed the certainty by comparison of rearing the proceeds each of these merits appeals to one or other of orchid growers many of the species which come from torrid lands indeed are troublesome but with such we are not concerned the cool varieties will do well anywhere provided they receive water enough in summer and not too little in winter i do not speak of the american and siberian classes which are nearly hopeless for the amateur nor of the hong kong cypripedium purpuratum a very puzzling example on the role of martyrs to orchidology mr pierce stands high to him we owe among many fine things the hybrid begonias which are becoming such favourites for bedding and other purposes he discovered the three original types parents of the innumerable garden flowers now on sale begonia piercei b veitchii and b boliviensis it was his great luck and great honour to find mastavalia veitchii so long so often so laboriously searched for from that day to this but never even heard of to collect another shipment of that glorious orchid mr pierce sailed for peru in the service i think of mr bull unhappily for us all as well as for himself he was detained at panama somewhere in those parts there is a magnificent cypripedium with which we are acquainted only by the dried inflorescence named planifolium the poor fellow could not resist this temptation they told him at panama that no white man had returned from the spot but he went on the indians brought him back some days or weeks later without the prize and he died on arrival 
Oncidiums also are a product of the new world exclusively. In fact, of the four classes most useful to amateurs, three belong wholly to America, and the fourth in great part. I resist the temptation to include Mastavalia, because that genus is not so perfectly easy as the rest. But if it be added, nine-tenths, assuredly, of the plants in our cool house come from the West. Among the special merits of the Oncidium is its colour. I have heard thoughtless persons complain that they are all yellow, which, as a statement of fact, is near enough to the truth, for about three-fourths may be so described roughly. But this dispensation is another proof of nature's kindly regard for the interests of our science. A clear, strong, golden yellow is the colour that would have been wanting in our cool houses had not the Oncidium supplied it. Shades of lemon and buff are frequent among odontoglossums, but, in a rough, general way of speaking, they have a white ground. Mastavalias give us scarlet and orange and purple, Lycastes green and dull yellow, Sophronotis crimson, Mesospinidium rose, and so forth. Blue must not be looked for. Even counting the new Utricularia for an orchid, as most people do, there are, I think, but five species that will live among us at present, in all the prodigious family, showing this colour, and every one of them is very hot. Thus it appears that the Oncidium fills a gap, and how gloriously! There is no such pure gold in the scheme of the universe as it displays under fifty shapes wondrously varied. Thus Oncidium macranthum, one is continually tempted to exclaim, as one or other glory of the orchid world recurs to mind, that it is the supreme triumph of floral beauty. I have sinned thus, and I know it. Therefore let the reader seek an opportunity to behold O. Macanthrum, and judge for himself. But it seems to me that nature gives us a hint. As though proudly conscious what a marvel it will unfold, this superb flower often demands nine months to perfect itself. Dr. Wallace told me of an instance in his collection where eighteen months elapsed from the appearance of the spike until the opening of the first bloom. But it lasts a time proportionate. Nature forestalled the dreams of aesthetic colorists when she designed Oncidium macranthum. Thus, and not otherwise, would the thoughtful of them arrange a harmony in gold and bronze. But nature, with characteristic indifference to the fancies of mankind, hid her chef d'oeuvre in the wilds of Ecuador. Hardly less striking, however, though perhaps less beautiful, are its sisters of the small-lipped species, Oncidium serratum, O. superbiens, and O. sculptum. This last is rarely seen. As with others of its class, the spike grows very long, twelve feet perhaps, if it were allowed to stretch. The flowers are small, comparatively, clear, bronze-brown, highly polished, so closely and daintily frilled round the edges, that a fairy goffering iron could not give more regular effects, and outlined by a narrow band of gold. Oncidium serratum has a much larger bloom, but less compact, rather fly away indeed, its sepals widening gracefully from a narrow neck. Excessively curious is the disposition of the petals, which close their tips to form a circle of brown and gold around the column. The purpose of this extraordinary arrangement, unique among orchids, I believe, will be discovered one day, for purpose there is, no doubt. To judge by analogy, it may be supposed that the insect upon which Oncidium serratum depends for fertilization likes to stand upon this ring while thrusting its proboscis into the nectary. The fourth of these fine species, Oncidium superbiens, ranks among the grandest of flowers. Knowing its own value, it rarely consents to oblige. The dusty green sepals are margined with yellow, petals white, clouded with pale purple, lip very small, of course purple surmounted by a great golden crest. Most strange and curious is Oncidium fuscatum, of which the shape defies description. Seen from the back, it shows a floriated cross of equal limbs, but in front the nethermost is hidden by a spreading lip, very large proportionately. The prevailing tint is a dun purple, but each arm has a broad white tip. Dun purple also is the centre of the labellum, 
edged with a distinct band of lighter hue, which again, towards the margin, becomes white. These changes of tone are not gradual, but as clear as a brush could make them. Botanists must long to dissect this extraordinary flower, but the opportunity seldom occurs. It is desperately puzzling to understand how nature has packed away the component parts of its inflorescence, so as to resolve them into four narrow arms and a labellum. But the colouring of this plant is not always dull. In the small botanic garden at Florence, by Santa Maria Maggiore, I remarked with astonishment an Oncidium fuscatum, of which the lip was scarlet crimson, and the other tints bright to match. That collection is admirably grown, but orchids are still scarce in Italy. The society did not know what a prize it had secured by chance. The genus Oncidium has perhaps more examples of a startling combination in hues than any other, but one must speak thoughtfully and cautiously upon such points. I have not to deal with culture, but one hint may be given. Gardeners who have a miscellaneous collection to look after often set themselves against an experiment in orchid growing, because these plants suffer terribly from green fly and other pests, and will not bear smoking. To keep them clean and healthy by washing demands labour for which they have no time. This is a very reasonable objection, but though the smoke of tobacco is actually ruination, no plant whatever suffers from the steam thereof. An ingenious Frenchman has invented and patented in England lately a machine called the Thanatophore, which I confidently recommend. It can be obtained from Monsieur B. S. Williams of Upper Holloway. The Thanatophore destroys every insect within reach of its vapour, excepting, curiously enough, scaly bug, which, however, does not persecute cool orchids much. The machine may be obtained in different sizes through any good ironmonger. To sum up, these plants ask nothing in return for the measureless enjoyments they give, but light, shade from the summer sun, protection from the winter frost, moisture, and brains. I am allowed to print a letter which bears upon several points to which I have alluded. It is not cheerful reading for the enthusiast. He will be apt to cry, Would that the difficulties and perils were infinitely graver! so grave that the collecting grounds might have a rest for twenty years. January the 19th, 1893 Dear Sir, I have received your two letters asking for Cattleya Lorenziana, Pancratium Guianense, and Catasetum Pileatum. Kindly excuse my answering your letters only to-day, but I have been away in the interior, and on my return was sick, beside other business taking up my time. I was unable to write until today. Now let me give you some information concerning orchid collecting in this colony. Six or seven years ago, just when the gold industry was starting, very few people ever ventured into the far interior. Boats, river hands, and Indians could be hired at ridiculously low prices, and travelling and bartering paid. Wages for Indians being about a shilling per day, and all found. The same for river hands captains and boatswains to pilot the boat through the rapids, up and down, for sixty-four cents a day. Today you have got to pay sixty-four to eighty cents per day for Indians and river hands, captains and boatswains two dollars the former and one dollar fifty the latter per day, and then you often cannot get them. Boat hire used to be eight dollars to ten dollars for a big boat for three to four months. Today, five dollars, six dollars, and seven dollars per day, and all through the rapid development of the gold industry. As you can calculate twenty-five days' river travel to get within reach of the savannah lands, you can reckon what the expenses must be, and then again about five to seven days coming down the river, and a couple of days to lay over. Then you must count two trips like this, one to bring you up and one to bring you down three months after, when you return with your collection. Beside this, you run the risk of losing your boat in the rapids either way, which happens not very unfrequently either going or coming, and we have not only to record the loss of several boats with goods, etc., every month, but generally to record the loss of life, only two cases happening last month, in one case seven, in the other twelve men losing their lives. Besides, river hands and blacks will not go up further than the boats can travel, and nothing will induce them to go among the Indians being afraid of getting poisoned by Indians, Kaiserimas, or strangled, 
so you have to rely utterly on Indians, which you often cannot get, as the district of Roraima is very poorly inhabited, and most of the Indians died by smallpox and measles breaking out among them four years ago, and those that survived left the district, and you will find whole districts nearly uninhabited. About five years ago I went up with Mr. Osmers to Roraima, but he broke down before we reached the savannah. He lay there for a week, and I gave him up. He recovered, however, and dragged himself into the savannah near Roraima, about three days distant from it, where I left him. Here we found and made a splendid collection of about three thousand first-class plants of different kinds. While I was going up to Roraima, he stayed in the savannah, still too sick to go further. At Roraima, I collected everything except Cattleya Lorenziana, which was utterly rooted out already by former collectors. On my return to Osmer's camp, I found him more dead than alive, thrown down by a new attack of sickness, but not alone that I also found him abandoned by most of our Indians, who had fled on account of the Canaima having killed three of their number. So Mr. Osmers, who got soon better, and I, made up our baskets with plants, and made everything ready. Our Indians returning partly, I sent him ahead with as many loads as we could carry, I staying behind with the rest of baskets of plants. Had all our Indians come back, we would have been all right, but this not being the case, I had to stay until the Indians returned, and fetched me off. After this we got back all right. This was before the sickness broke out among the Indians. Last year I went up with Mr. Cromer, who met me going up river while I was coming down, so I joined him. We got up all right to the river's head, but here our troubles began, as we got only about eight Indians to go on with us, who had worked in the gold diggings and no others could be had, the district being abandoned. We had to pay them half a dollar a day to carry loads, so we pushed on, carrying part of our loads, leaving the rest of our cargo behind, until we reached the savannah, when we had to send them back several times to get the balance of our goods. From the time we reached the savannah we were starving, more or less, as we could procure only very little provisions. We hunted all about for Cattleya Lorenziana, and got only about fifteen hundred or so, it growing only here and there. At Roraima we did not hunt at all, as the district is utterly rubbed out by the Indians. We were about fourteen days at Roraima, and got plenty of Utricularia Cambelliana, U. Humboldtii, and U. Montana, also Zygopetalum, Cypripedium Lindleyanum, Oncidium nigratum, only fifty, very rare now, Cypripedium Schombergianum, Zygopetalum burkii, and in fact all that is to be found on and about Roraima, except the Cattleya Lorenziana, also plenty others as Sobralia, Liliastrum, etc. So our collection was not a very great one. We had the hardest trouble now through the want of Indians to carry the loads. Beside this, the rainy weather set in, and our loads suffered badly for all the care we took of them. Besides, the Indians got disagreeable, having to go back several times to bring the remaining baskets. Nevertheless, we got down as far as the Kurubing Mountains. Up to this time we were more or less always starving. Arrived at the Kurubing Mountains, procured a scant supply of provisions, but lost nearly all of them in a small creek, and what was saved was spoiling under our eyes, it being then that the rainy season had fully started, drenching us from morning to night. It took us nine days to get our loads over the mountain, where our boat was to reach us, to take us down river and we were for two and a half days entirely without food. Besides the plants being damaged by stress of weather, the Indians had opened the baskets and thrown partly the loads away, not being able to carry the heavy soaked through baskets over the mountains, so making us lose the best of our plants. Arrived at our landing, we had to wait for our boat, which arrived a week later in consequence of the river being high, and of course short of provisions. Still we got away with what we had of our loads until we reached the first gold places, kept by a friend of mine, who supplied us with food. Thereafter we started for town. Halfway at Kapuri Falls, one of the most dangerous, we swamped down over a rock, and so we lost some of our things. Still saved all our plants, though they lay for a few hours under water with the boat. After this we reached town in safety. So after coming home we found on packing up, that we had only about nine hundred plants, that is, Cattleya Lorenziana, of which about one-third good, one-third medium, and one-third poor quality. This trip took us about three and a half months, and cost over two thousand five hundred dollars, 
besides i having poisoned my leg on a rotten stump which i run up in my foot lay for four months suffering terrible pain you will of course see from this that orchid hunting is no pleasure as you of course know but what i want to point out to you is that cattleya lorenziana is very rare in the interior now the river expense is fearfully high, in fact unreasonably high, on account of the gold digging. Labourers getting sixty-four cents to one dollar per day, and all found. No Indians to be got, and those that you can get at ridiculous prices, and getting them too by working on places where they build and thatch houses and clear the ground from underbush, and as huntsmen for gold diggers. Even if Mr. Cromer had succeeded to get three thousand or four thousand fine Cattleya Lorenziana, it would have been of no value to us, as we could not have got anybody to carry them to the river, where a boat could reach. Besides this, I must also tell you that there is a license to be paid out here if you want to collect orchids, amounting to one hundred dollars, which Mr. Cromer had to pay, and also an export tax duty of two cents per piece so that orchid collecting is made a very expensive affair. Besides its success being very doubtful, even if a man is very well acquainted with Indian life and has visited the savannah reaches year after year, we spent something over two thousand five hundred to two thousand nine hundred dollars, including Mr. Cromer's and Steigfer's passage out on our last expedition. If you want to get any Lorenziana, you will have to send yourself, and as I said before, the results will be very doubtful. As far as I myself am concerned, I am interested, besides my baking business, in the gold diggings, and shall go up to the savannah in a few months. I can give you first-class references if you should be willing to send an expedition, and we could come to some arrangement. At least, you would save the expenses of the passage of one of your collectors. I may say that I am quite conversant with the way of packing orchids, and handling them as well, for travel as shipment. Kindly excuse, therefore, my lengthy letter and its bad writing and if you should be inclined to go in for an expedition, just send me a list of what you require, and I will tell you whether the plants are found along the route of travel, and in the savannah visited, as, for instance, Cattleya superba does not grow at all in the district where Cattleya Lorenziana is to be found, but far further south. Before closing, I beg you to let me know the prices of about twenty-five of the best of, and prettiest, South American orchids, which I want for my own collection as Cattleya medellii, Cattleya trianae, Odontoglossum crispum, Miltonia vexillaria, Cattleya labiata, and so on. I shall wait your answer as soon as possible, and send you a list by last mail of what is to be got in this colony. We also found on our last list something new, a very large bulb Donchidium, or maybe Catasatum, on the top of Roraima, where we spent a night, but got only two specimens, one of which got lost, and the other one I left in the hands of Mr. Rodway, but so we tried our best. It decayed, having been too seriously damaged to revive and flower, and so enable us to see what it was, it not being in flower when found. Awaiting your kind reply, yours truly, Seela. P.S. If you should send out one of your collectors or require any information, I shall be glad to give it. One of the most experienced collectors, Monsieur Oversluis, writes from the Rio de Yanayaka, January 1893. Here it is absolutely necessary that one goes himself into the woods ahead of the peons, who are quite cowards to enter the woods, and not altogether without reason, for the larger part of them get sick here. And it is very hard to enter, nearly impenetrable and full of insects which make fresh-coming people to get cracked and mad. I have from the waist down not a place to put in a shilling piece which is not a wound through the very small red spider and other insects. Also my people are the same. Of the five men I took out, two have got fever already, and one ran back. Tomorrow I expect other peons, but not a single one from Mengabamba. It is a trouble to get men who will come into the woods, and I cannot have more than eight or ten to work with, because when I should not be continually behind them or ahead, they do nothing. It is not a question of money to do good here, but merely luck, and the way one treats people. The peons will come out less for their salaries than for good and plenty of food, which is very difficult to find in these scarce times. The plants are here one by one, and we have got but one tree with three plants. They are on the highest and biggest trees, and these must be cut down with axes. Below are all shrubs full of climbers and lianas about a finger-width. 
Every step must be cut to advance, and the ground cleared below the high trees in order to spy the branches. It is a very difficult job. Nature has well protected this Cattleya. Nobody can like this kind of work. The poor man ends abruptly. I will write when I can. The mosquitoes don't leave me a moment. The end of section six of About Orchids, a chat.